Hey there, I'm Sarah Thompson. I'm 32, killing it in my marketing career and living the dream with my husband, Mike, in our cozy little suburban nest. We busted our butts for years to get this place, pinching pennies and working overtime. It's not a mansion, but it's ours, you know? Now enter the in-laws, Robert and Linda Carter. On the surface, everything's peachy. We host these big family dinners, and Mike and I are always ready to lend a hand when they need it. But let me tell you, there's more bubbling under the surface than a pot of mom's famous chili. Last Sunday, we had them over for our monthly dinner. I'd spent all day cooking up a storm, determined to impress Linda with my pot roast. As we sat down to eat, Robert cleared his throat. Sarah, this looks amazing. You've really outdone yourself this time. I beamed, feeling pretty proud of myself. Thanks, Robert. I hope it tastes as good as it looks. We tucked in and for a while it was just the sound of forks scraping plates. Then Linda piped up. Oh, Sarah, I meant to ask you. You work in marketing, right? We were wondering if you could give us some advice on a little business venture we're considering. I nearly choked on my green beans. This wasn't the first time they'd fished for financial advice, and alarm bells started ringing in my head. Oh, what kind of venture? I asked, trying to keep my voice neutral. Robert jumped in, his eyes gleaming with excitement. It's this amazing opportunity. A friend of mine told me about it. We could double our money in just a few months. I exchanged a glance with Mike. He looked as uncomfortable as I felt. That sounds... interesting, I said carefully. But you know, high returns usually come with high risks. Maybe we could take a look at the details together? Linda waved her hand dismissively. Oh, don't worry about that. We trust our friend. Actually, we were hoping you might be able to help us out with a small loan to get started. Just a few thousand dollars. The pot roast suddenly felt like lead in my stomach. This was far from the first time they'd asked for money, and something about it always made me uneasy. But every time I voiced my concerns to Mike, he'd say, They're family, Sarah. We have to help out when we can. I forced a smile. Why don't we discuss this after dinner? Let's enjoy the food while it's hot. As the evening wore on, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. But I pushed it down, telling myself I was overreacting. They were family, after all. What could possibly go wrong? Little did I know that uneasy feeling in my gut was trying to warn me about the storm that was about to hit our lives. If only I'd listened to it sooner. It was just another Tuesday when my world came crashing down. I was knee-deep in a marketing campaign when my phone rang. The caller ID showed it was our bank. Weird, I thought, but picked up anyway. Mrs. Thompson? This is Jerry from First National Bank. I'm calling about your missed mortgage payments. I nearly dropped the phone. Missed payments? There must be some mistake. We've never missed a payment in our lives. Jerry's voice was sympathetic but firm. I'm afraid there's no mistake, Mrs. Thompson. You're three months behind. My head was spinning. I thanked Jerry and hung up, then immediately called Mike. Honey, we need to go to the bank, now. An hour later, we were sitting across from a bank manager, staring at documents we'd never seen before. My stomach churned as I recognized the forged signatures, a crude imitation of our own. This can't be happening, Mike muttered, his face pale. We spent the next few days in a fog, piecing together what had happened. The trail led straight to Robert and Linda. They'd somehow used our house as collateral for a massive loan, then defaulted on it. When we confronted them, it was like a scene from a bad movie. We stood in their living room, the air thick with tension. How could you do this to us? I demanded, my voice shaking with anger and disbelief. Robert at least had the decency to look ashamed. Linda, on the other hand, was all indignation. We had no choice, she cried. It was a foolproof investment opportunity. We were going to pay it all back before you even noticed. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Foolproof? You put our home at risk for some get-rich-quick scheme? Mike, usually the calm one, was seething. Do you have any idea what you've done? We could lose everything. Robert tried to placate us. Now, now, let's not overreact. We can fix this. We just need a little more time. I cut him off. Time? You've had months. 
The bank is talking about foreclosure, for God's sake. Linda had the audacity to look offended. Well, if you'd just loaned us the money when we asked, none of this would have happened. I saw red. Are you seriously trying to blame us for your fraud? Mike put a hand on my arm, his voice dangerously quiet. I think we're done here. We'll be talking to our lawyer. Don't contact us again. As we left, I felt like I was in a daze. How could the people who were supposed to love us betray us so completely? Back home, the reality of our situation hit me like a ton of bricks. Our dream home, the one we'd worked so hard for, was at risk because of their greed and stupidity. I broke down, sobbing in Mike's arms. What are we going to do? He held me tight, his voice determined. We're going to fight, Sarah. We're not going down without a fight. As I lay in bed that night, unable to sleep, I realized something. The unease I'd felt all those months ago wasn't just paranoia. It was my instinct trying to protect us. And from now on, I was going to listen to it. Little did I know, this was just the beginning of our battle. But one thing was certain. I wasn't about to let Robert and Linda Carter destroy everything we'd built. They had no idea who they were messing with. The next morning I was up before dawn, fueled by a mix of anger and determination. I'd spent half the night researching lawyers and found Amanda Reyes, a shark in a power suit who specialized in fraud cases. By 9 a.m., I was in her office. So, Mrs. Thompson, walk me through what happened, Amanda said, her sharp eyes focused on me. I laid out the whole sordid tale watching her expression darken. This is serious, but we can fight it. I'll start the legal proceedings immediately. As Amanda worked her magic, I decided to do some digging of my own. I started with a call to Mike's cousin, Tom. Sarah? What's up? Tom, I need to ask you something. Have Robert and Linda ever asked you for money? There was a long pause. Yeah, they did. Lost my entire savings in some can't-miss investment opportunity. Why? My heart sank. You're not the only one. Over the next few weeks, I uncovered a trail of financial destruction. Aunt Martha, our old neighbor Jim, even Linda's own sister. All victims of the Carter's schemes. I gathered statements, documented losses, built a case that made my blood boil. One night, as I poured over the evidence, Mike walked in, looking exhausted. Sarah, it's 2 a.m. Come to bed. I shook my head. I can't. I'm so close to cracking this. Mike sighed. You need to rest. We both do. I felt a flare of irritation. How can you think about rest when we could lose everything? And how is running yourself into the ground going to help? He snapped back. We stared at each other, the tension palpable. This wasn't us. We never fought like this. I'm sorry, I said softly. I just... I can't let them win. Mike's expression softened. He came over and wrapped his arms around me. We won't, but we need to do this together, okay? I nodded, realizing how much this was affecting us both. The next day, I met with Amanda to share my findings. This is gold, Sarah, she said, flipping through the documents. With this, we can not only save your house, but potentially bring charges against the Carters. I felt a glimmer of hope. So what's our next move? We gather all the victims, strength in numbers, and then we go after the Carters with everything we've got. I spent the next few days reaching out to everyone Robert and Linda had swindled. It wasn't easy. Some were ashamed, others afraid. But slowly they came around. We held a meeting at our house. The living room was packed, the air thick with shared anger and pain. They took everything from us, Aunt Martha sobbed. Jim, our ex-neighbor, nodded grimly. Promised to double my retirement fund. Now I'm back to working part-time at 70. As I listened to their stories, my resolve strengthened. This wasn't just about Mike and me anymore. It was about justice for everyone the Carters had hurt. We're going to make this right, I promised them. Together, we're going to make sure Robert and Linda can never do this to anyone else. As everyone left, Mike pulled me aside. I'm proud of you. You know that? I smiled, feeling truly hopeful for the first time in weeks. We're not out of the woods yet, but... 
but we're fighting back, Mike finished, and we're doing it as a team. That night, as we lay in bed, I felt a shift. The fear and anger were still there, but now there was something else too. Determination, hope, and the unshakable knowledge that no matter what happened next, Mike and I would face it together. Little did Robert and Linda know, their day of reckoning was coming, and I was going to make damn sure they never saw it coming. The day of the court hearing arrived, and I felt like I was going to be sick. As we walked into the courtroom, I saw Robert and Linda for the first time in months. They looked smaller somehow, less intimidating. Amanda squeezed my arm. You've got this, Sarah. Just tell the truth. As I took the stand, I locked eyes with Linda. She looked away first. Mrs. Thompson, can you tell the court what happened? I took a deep breath and laid it all out. The forged documents, the unauthorized loan, the years of manipulation. With each word, I felt stronger. And it wasn't just us, I concluded. They've been doing this for years, to countless others. The defense tried to paint it as a misunderstanding, but Amanda was relentless. She brought forward victim after victim, each story more damning than the last. Halfway through the proceedings, a commotion erupted in the gallery. A man I didn't recognize burst in, waving papers. Your Honor, I have information relevant to this case. Turns out, karma had perfect timing. The Carter's foolproof investment had just imploded spectacularly, taking what was left of their money with it. As the judge reviewed the new evidence, I watched Robert and Linda crumble. It was over, and they knew it. The verdict came swiftly. Not only did we keep our house, but Robert and Linda were facing serious jail time and multiple lawsuits. Outside the courthouse, Mike hugged me tight. We did it, Sarah. It's over. But it wasn't over. Not really. As we drove home, I couldn't shake the faces of all the other victims. Mike, I said suddenly, I want to start a support group for people like us who've been victims of financial fraud. He smiled. I think that's a great idea. Over the next few months, we rebuilt our lives. We cut all ties with Robert and Linda. Last I heard, they were serving time in separate prisons. Good riddance. Our support group grew quickly. Every week we'd meet in our living room, the same room where this whole nightmare started. But now, instead of tension and betrayal, it was filled with hope and healing. One night after everyone had left, Mike found me staring out the window. Penny for your thoughts? I turned to him feeling a wave of gratitude. I was just thinking, as horrible as this all was, I'm almost glad it happened. He raised an eyebrow. Really? I nodded. It taught me to trust my instincts. It showed me how strong we are together. And now we're helping others. That's pretty amazing, don't you think? Mike pulled me close. You're pretty amazing. As we stood there, in the home we'd fought so hard to keep, I realized something. The Carters had tried to take everything from us, but they'd failed. In fact, they'd given us something invaluable. The knowledge that we could face anything, as long as we faced it together. Life isn't always fair. Sometimes the people who should love you the most end up hurting you the worst. But here's what I've learned. It's not about avoiding betrayal. It's about how you rise above it. How you take that pain and turn it into something meaningful. And that's exactly what we did. One day at a time, one person at a time, we're making a difference. And honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way. If you were in my position, would you have ever considered forgiving Robert and Linda for what they did? Is there a line that, once crossed, makes reconciliation impossible, even with family?